Alright guys, welcome back to Home Theater Gurus. This is episode 35. So we're going to take our subwoofer from episode 34, the hammer, and we're going to make it look like a million bucks, like glass. And you can take this same procedure and make your Bose cubes look like a million bucks. Your soup cans, everybody in the neighborhood will want to come over to your house and eat soup because your soup cans look so awesome. So we're going to start off with primer. We've got a primer cabinet. We're going to mix this epoxy primer is what we're going to be using and we're mixing it up really good. It's really thick. And we're going to be using some paint cups and they have ratios. They help you get the ratio right because we need a one to one mix. The arrow you see is pointing at a one to one. And we're going to fill it up to a three with the primer. And then we're going to use the catalyst and we're going to fill it up to the second three, number three line for a one to one mix. Remember, we're following the one to one mix lines on this cup. And if we wanted a 3 to 1 or a 4 to 1, there's other lines for those uh, ratios. And we're using a Harbor Freight HVLP sprayer. I think I spent 25 or 30 bucks on it. I did order this little stand right here. As you see, I, I really need it, but it's not in yet. Thanks, COVID. So make sure you shake it up real good or stir it up really good. You know, your, your catalyst and your uh, primer. And here I'm getting my pressures right. We're going to be spraying... Yeah, anywhere from 25 to 30 psi and on the HVLP you'll pull the trigger back until you hear air coming out but before the needle pulls back when the paint starts releasing now if you get this in your hand it'll make sense once you actually see the gun and how it works but when you pull it about halfway you're just getting air out and that's when you adjust your air and this is what it looks like the little air adjuster and on my tank pressure you want to make sure you have plenty of tank pressure you know, if it got it set for 60. Yeah, we're slowing it down so you can actually see the primer. And you never want to stop with the needle pull back. In other words, with paint coming out. If you do that, you're going to pile paint up on your cabinet. It's going to run. So as you see, I'm releasing the trigger past the cabinet and then pulling it before I come back onto the cabinet. So I want to make sure that the gun is moving at all times. Anytime the paint is coming out, my hand is moving. And I'm doing half laps here, 50% coverage. So uh, you'll see like how the paint leaves like a little tail. I'm going to point the center of my gun at the edge of that tail. So every time, it's almost like I'm getting two coats per coat or two passes of coverage, if that makes sense. There we go. You see how where I'm, I'm aiming at? Well, this one isn't a good example. You can also watch a bunch of YouTube videos, believe me. I watched a bunch. I'm not a professional painter by any means. Uh, but, I, you know, I can make do. I can watch a YouTube video and follow it, which, uh, you know, you can do the same thing. This is not that difficult. It's just kind of having a ballpark idea, you know, how the steps need to go. And this epoxy primer is so much better than rattle cans. I used rattle cans on one of my, uh, my first time I used HVLP. I started off with rattle can primer, you know, like Rust Oleum, and that stuff gets expensive. I mean, I probably spent 40 bucks in Rust Oleum paint, and the primer still sucked, the primer job. You know, I mean, it just like it didn't cover the MDF very well. It's like it kept soaking it up. And then I tried the MDF or this uh, epoxy primer. It was 35 bucks for the catalyst and the primer. And I mean, it's one coat, you're really ready to paint you know your base coat on top of it it seals it so well it's like it's no longer even wood but I am gonna put two coats on this one just because I had plenty of primer on hand alright so this is the next day and we're gonna be using our Porta Cable random orb orbital sander and I've got some uh, 320 grit sandpaper you know you want something kinda of fine now you can go finer you see I wish I would have bought this right here I didn't prepare for this very well would have saved me some hand work we're gonna be we're messing with uh, orange peel and that was a picture of, picture of orange peel and it resembles the peel of an orange and what happens is your paint resembles this like when you look close up and we're going to be sanding away those peaks those high spots and anytime you look at a new vehicle even painted by a robot they have orange peel if you look at it close enough you're going to see it and so that's all we're doing and we're going to do that again in the further steps when we really make this thing look like glass you know we're going to have a lot more orange peel to deal with here there's not much but we just want to get this primer you know really really nice and smooth and we're going to have to use water do not try to do this without water and you know normally what we're using here is a sander made for wood 
and the particles of wood will be combined or collected in the little bag but this has water in it so it's not even getting sucked into the machine I mean it's still everything in there is still dry when I go to dump it out there's all, there's wood in there right now some MDF dust it doesn't pull into it because it's weighted down by the water and all this you see my rag is black here that's the sludge like the the those little high spots I showed you in the orange peel that's that's those highs that we've removed we're actually removing material and flattening it out we just want a nice smooth primer surface to lay our base coat on top of now we have to be very very careful of the edges because you know the flat spots are really it's kind of hard to screw them up really because they're flat and you're evenly distributing you know your sanding disc but if you hit an edge where all of a sudden you know you're putting a lot of PSI on like a, a small area like that you know those edges it'll burn through it so fast even when later steps when we're messing with uh, the compound rubbing compound and just trying to get that high shine on this thing and bringing that glass out you still have to be careful of the edges and this is the uh, optional isolation platform that I'm uh, kind of messing around with here and I think I've pretty much got it perfected and there is a uh, not only a cut sheet for this sub that you saw in the previous episode there is actually a flat pack I got together with GSG who makes the Marty sub and the Devastators and they're gonna make flat packs for this baby so I've got a sanding sponge you want to make sure you're using the sanding sponge and you know, we've got some fine grit sandpaper and this is what we're gonna use for the edges we do not want to hit these edges those 45s with 320 grit on a uh, you know a, a power sander because we're going to burn through the edges so we're going to do this work here by hand and I'm just kind of putting pressure in the middle of it you know I've got that sponge and I'm kind of I've got my index finger or whatever kind of in the middle of that 45 kind of keeping the pressure off those edges as much as possible you know you just have to be careful you don't want to burn through them but if you did the worst thing that would happen is maybe you need to touch it up a little with a little can uh, you know spray paint uh, primer. I mean, I wouldn't recoat the whole thing if you just had a little spot that had some, you know, that you burned the primer off of when you were sanding. And believe me, I've done it before. It happens. But when I get finished, you know, just because there's a few boo-boos along the way, you wouldn't know it. We can, we can fix a lot, especially in the finishing stages, as you're going to see in this video a little bit later. And we also need to make sure it's clean. Now this is epoxy primer, so we can use, you know, alcohol works really good. It dries fast, so I'm using that. It really removes that residue really, really well. All right, now we're getting ready to paint. This is the next day. Uh, I did the, uh, got the primer all prepped after work, so it was in the evening. And see, I've got it nice and clean here, and it's got a sheen to it. We're gonna make sure it's good and clean now if I would have had my tack cloths I didn't think I did I thought I was all out and forgot to order some but it turns out in my Tupperware you know large Tupperware bucket or container with all the HVLP stuff I found some tack cloths after I finished the whole dang job so it was a little bit late but tack cloth works great for cleaning all of this stuff it has like a tacky you know texture to it and just pulls the, the little dust off of it before you paint so that's something you definitely want to have on hand and everything's going to be in the description links for everything and you see here i'm using a strainer before i pour it in my cup and i did that on the primer too you always want to use a strainer just so you don't get clumps and crap in your paint so now we're putting the base coat on and the base coat i'm using is an acrylic base coat it's just a one part i don't have to mix it with anything so that makes it kind of easy but it's a honda red bass pearl and there's just a picture of what I had and didn't realize I had on hand, the uh, tack cloth. So this paint does have a pearl in it, so you're going to see that I'm going to kind of dust it after I spray the first coat on. Kind of make those pearls lay down or the kind of lay on the paint so they get an even coat. But anyway, you always want to have a little piece of test wood and make sure that it's looking good before you start working on what you're working on. All right, so we're slowing it down just so you can kind of see as it, go, as it goes on. You can see here how I'm doing the 50% laps. I'm aiming the gun at kind of the tail of the previous pass. Getting good coverage, keeping that gun moving. I'm not going to stop it. 
and I'm going to start it before I come into the, or as I'm moving on to the, uh, to the sub here. And you can see by that reflection there, I've got a good even coat. Now I'm going to use two coats of base, only because when I put the first coat on, I was talking to the buddy that actually gave me the paint. He lives in another state, and uh, I've sold him some some speakers and showed him how to line subs, and you know, so we're friends. And he uh, accidentally screwed it up while I was talking to him. I met, made a little boo boo on the baffle, and so I had to go back and do a second coat. But two coats of base is you know a good idea. It's not going to hurt anything. One coat would is fine if you get a good coat on the you know the first pass. Of course, inside this port, and it's kind of a pain in the butt, but I'm trying to get it in there as best I can. I actually turned my nozzle 90 degrees so the fan would spray, you know, into it. That's why I'm not holding the gun sideways, and I just straightened my, my uh, tip back out. And there we go. And you can kind of see how I'm working that needle and releasing it after I passed the speaker baffle and then starting the paint flow before I come into it and there I'm dusting on that pearl just trying to get a little even dusting on it so that way when the sun hits or the light hits it just right you know it's gonna it's, it's this auto paint we're using so it's gonna be just like a pearl coat on a Honda with paint it with red bask pearl Alright, now this one is a 4 to 1 mix. So we're going to be using the 4 to 1 scale in our little cup. That's four parts of our clear, and then, you know, we have our catalyst or our activator is going to be a one part. That's why you get a much larger can. You know, that can's a lot bigger than the can to the right of it, four times bigger. All right, and after this, you know, you need to start up really good. And actually, I kind of, you're not really supposed to shake the cans because you don't want a lot of air bubbles. You know, they say to swirl them. But, you know, I shook them up pretty good and make sure everything was mixed before I poured it into my little cup. And then I started them together really well. And I've got my strainer, and I'm going to go ahead and pour it in. And now it's time to start laying that glass down, liquid glass. Now, as we talked about before, orange peel. This is where you're going to get most of your orange peel. That base coat laid down really flat, so I mean, it looks good, but the clear coat, I'm putting four coats on. Now, like in previous projects I've done, you know, I did like two, but you're going to be sanding away a lot of this to get it flat, to get rid of all that orange peel. So I'm going to go ahead and put four coats on here just to give me a little more insurance, a little more that I can sand away. But if you look on Amazon, not Amazon, if you look on YouTube, you're going to notice that even the professional car, you know, guys that do this for a living, they have orange peel. Like you, something you can't really get rid of. Now you can make it so minor that you don't even really notice it unless you're looking really close. But if you look close, you're going to see it. So what we're going to be doing is called paint correction. You know, if you're spending six figures on a car, usually the paint correction is done at the factory. You know, but anything like from a Cadillac Lincoln on down, to a you know a freaking Yugo, you're gonna have you know they, they're sprayed by machines. You're gonna have uh, orange peel. So, but we're not gonna have it when we get done because we're gonna learn how to fix it. And that's really what makes it takes it to the next level. Really. Now again, if you're a professional automotive painter, I'm sure I'm doing a lot of stuff that you know like oh you shouldn't be doing that or you shouldn't be doing this. You know we're just. Uh, we're just here getting it done you know this is gonna work I've been doing you know I've done this more than once this is uh, actually my uh, I think my third time messing with HVLP this is my second time messing with a clear coat over it but uh, it's really not that difficult and it works every time it's kinda hard to screw up as long as you know the steps and yep I'm painting this outside and yes I've got some trash in the paint between coats if there was a bug I'd flake it out or pick it out and then the last clear coat now I did not touch it because I didn't want to damage that last clear coat but they're going to be fixed in the final stages and I guarantee you will not know it the first time I did this uh, clear coat base coat or base coat clear coat I did some module speakers and you see here I built a basically a paint booth in my shop had no trash whatsoever in the final in the paint but you can't tell. There was no difference between the results I got then and the results I got now. So we're not doing professional automobiles here. We're just doing little, you know, projects. Uh, 
and I'm not going to be doing a paint booth anymore I can tell you that and now we're just cleaning the gun now I clean this gun after every time you know every time I use it so uh, you know after I got done with the primer I cleaned it you know what I mean I want to keep up my tools so that was a little needle I just pulled out that's actually what releases the paint but uh, yeah we're just gonna clean it and put it back together and store it and remember I put four coats of that clear on there so we got a nice thick layer of clear coat and it's time to start getting rid of that orange peel and you can kinda see the orange peel right here when you look at the stand I mean even though it looks good and some people would be happy with it when I mean, you look up close you know we don't want that we want glass and that's what we're fixing to get now this orange peel is a little more extreme than I had like on my you know my first time I ever used it it actually looked pretty decent before I wet sanded it and got rid of the orange peel this one's a little more extreme but this is a good example because you're gonna see that we can still fix it I mean there's nothing you really can't fix when it comes to clear coat we're gonna start with a thousand grit and then we're gonna move up to 2000 grit now if uh, if I would have prepared better and next time I will I'm gonna be using a power sander I'll use my uh, orbital sander or maybe my electric DA you know buffer I'll get some patch for that and, and do all of this with that instead of by hand but this is what I have on hand of course this is cheaper now here we're using a sanding sponge but remember we're trying to knock those highs down especially if we've got a lot to knock down like we do there's a better alternative I'm gonna be using a sanding block of course a sanding block is hard and it's perfectly flat so we don't have to worry about it getting into those valleys it's just gonna be attacking the high spots and that's what we want and here's an example of what you know I would get you know if I was gonna do another one next week I would go ahead and order that now make it this process a little faster because this is really the only part that's kind of hard or you know strenuous and that's our orange peel this is the example again of what we're doing we're knocking those highs down and that's what gives us that glass look and gives it that depth you know that clear coat sitting on top makes it look like almost like you could reach into it I mean this is gonna be nicer than pretty much any car you've seen unless that car has had paint correction done to it because that's what we're doing and that's what really brings out the depth into the paint and all that white stuff you see as it dries you know this is sped up and so you'll be you'll see some of it kind of drying as we go that's clear coat you know that slurry right there that's all just clear coat that's clear coat being we're cutting into it and removing it and you know as your sandpaper gets kind of worn out it feels like it's not cutting as well you know go ahead and uh, move up to another get another sheet get some some fresh sandpaper and keep keep it wet you know we don't want to do any dry sanding we want to be wet sanding now this uh, clear coat has been sitting for 48 hours about two days so uh, it's still a little bit soft but you don't want to sand it like if you can smell like you put your nose up to it and if it still smells like it's curing you'll know it you'll, you'll still have a strong smell don't don't sand it yet it's not ready you can also take your fingernail and try to put an indentation into the clear coat and you know do it where you know you're gonna be covering it up maybe on the bottom somewhere it's that's not gonna be seen because if you put a dent in it you know you don't want to dent your paint but uh, once you can no longer put a dent in it that's when it's ready to sand and like I said this one took two days and the longer you let it sit you know the harder it's gonna be and we're using thousand grit I probably should have had 800 grit maybe some uh, 600 or something like that because it it took a little bit of elbow grease to get down into that clear coat but uh, the thousand grit did it you know if, now if I would have been using a power like an orbital sander the thousand grit would have worked really really well you know without really any elbow grease at all but now again be very careful of these edges when you get by the edges you're gonna see I'm gonna swap out to the sanding sponge well I mean I'm getting it here but I'm keeping that sanding block flat but anytime I'm really working on them I'm gonna go to sanding sponge and anytime you know I'm, I'm working on those 45s I'm gonna use the sanding block a little but I've got to make sure I keep it really flat you just have to be very very careful because we're removing so much material right now and that sanding block you know when it's flat it removes slow but anytime you get on the corner or an edge it's gonna take it away really quickly and you can see all that dried uh, clear coat on there 
we've removed a lot of clear coat but again you know as it's drying you're gonna see like little pits and those are the low spots you know from that little picture I drew for you earlier you know so so you'll you can tell whenever you've completely removed all the highs and you're starting to actually get into like the the coat underneath you know where those valleys are and you want to stop really before you get there if you see a few little pits you're not going to see them once we're done you know once we compound and buff you're not going to notice it at all so you're just trying to get it to where there's it's just nice and smooth like when this stuff dries you want to see it you don't want to see any pits because those low spots you know we're not able to reach down into them and sand them really right now so they're gonna look different like a little bit different color kind of like a Swiss cheese you're gonna see those low spots and you want to keep on sanding down and down and down until you really don't see that anymore and it looks like just one matte flat surface with no pits and again we're being really careful on these edges All right, and there we go. See, now we've got our 1,000 grit. We cleaned it really good. You want to clean it. Now we're going to hit it with some 2,000. Now, pretty much all this 2,000 is doing is removing the scratches from the 1,000. The 1,000 is where we did our work. That's where we removed the clear coat, you know, and really took those highs down. Now, this 1,000 grit, it will, or I'm sorry, this 2,000 grit, it will take the clear coat down as well, but you're going to have to work a lot harder. But primarily, we're just removing scratches. And if you want to, you can move up to 2,500 at this step to go a little bit further. But as you're going to see, the compound is going to be able to take it from this point and bring it to glass. But you definitely want to use 2,000 over the 1,000 to get rid of the scratches. Because that 1,000 is going to leave some scratches. But they're very, very minor scratches. Like if you scratched your car, I mean, this is actually the stuff I have here you can use on a vehicle. Oh, you can see that shine there. See, that's with 2000, I cleaned it up real good. I mean, it's getting a nice sheen on it already. And I mean, it, it actually feels like glass by hand. You know, of course it doesn't look like it yet, but it's getting there. It's fixing to get there really fast here in just a minute. Because the next step is what makes it, it, really brings it out and makes it pop. And going from the 1000 to the 2000, again, we're not removing a lot. We're just getting rid of scratches because it moves along pretty quickly. This does not take long at all. You know, the, the step that takes the longest is getting rid of the initial orange peel. And that was done with a 1000 grit. All right, cutting disc. So we've got a Meguiar's cutting disc. We're gonna get our rotary. Now this is a buffer. Now this is also an orbital buffer. It's a dual action, so it doesn't just spin. It also vibrates. So you can actually, the pad doesn't even have to spin to do its job. So this is kind of what you want to get. It's much safer. You can't really burn your paint with this one because, you know, if you just had one that spun. You wouldn't be able to stop it. You could put too much pressure on it, burn right through the clear coat. You know, it also, they have a lot more heat. This one stays cooler and it's just a lot safer to use. Now, I don't think Harbor Freight sells this one anymore, but I will put some links down below to some other alternatives, you know, by other companies that do the same thing. Now, we're going to preload the pad here, you know, just because we don't want, oh, I've got some on my shoe. Dang it. So, we're preloading the pad. We don't want to put our little blobs onto our paint and then the pad just soak them right up. Now online you'll see different, you know, some people will say put five little dime sizes of, you know, the compound on your pad. You know, you'll see that I'm just kind of winging it here. There's going to be a few times where I have way too much. Right now I'm probably using about the right amount. It's, you know, not too much. And here in a little while you're going to look like I could probably bathe in it because I definitely use too much. But like I said, this is, it's, it's hard to screw up. It, it just is. Because believe me, if someone could screw it up, it would be me. Now again, I'm doing kind of the same thing as I was when I was spraying, where I'm going like half passes. So, you know, that's, uh, we're gonna make sure we get good coverage here. And we're gonna do like a cross hatch pattern where we're gonna go down, like we're coming, you know, 
I'm going towards me, then away from me, and then I'm going to start going side to side on the way back. And, you know, or just whatever floats your boat. But, uh, you want to make sure you get really good coverage. Now, some people say to go like four or five passes, like, you know, up and down, forward and back, up and down, forward and back, up and down, you know, do that process like, uh, five times so you're covering the entire thing like five times and then clean it off and look at it and see if you need to redo it you know i just you know i try to make sure i get several passes before i clean it off and then see if i need to put another another coat and do it again and that's what i'm doing right here i'm going to do pass or our set of passes number two kind of spread out the compound here and you can see that haze is gone we've already got a mirror uh, finish. I mean, it looked just great right now, but it doesn't look anything like it's fixing to look. So we're going to do our second pass, and we're, we're removing more scratches and uh, you know taking out that last little bit of haze. Now this is some really good compound I'm using. Um, you can actually use it, you know, as a buff too, just because I mean it really brings the shine so well. But we're not going to. We actually we're going to use a buff that is actually gonna really ice the cake and again on the these edges make sure you're holding that thing at 45 degrees try not to round it over and eat into your edge it's very easy to do you know, don't hit it too long don't push too hard try to keep it moving it's not going to take very long I mean, as you see just a couple passes and I've got glass you know I'm going from that you know that uh kind of flat looking sheen down there to just bam there's glass and it's not hard I mean this is not a long process at all this is actually really fast And here's one of those times where I said I had too much. That is definitely too much compound. But, you know, I was kind of in a screw it attitude at this point. So I'm just going to go ahead and work it. Now, you also need to keep your pad clean. If you watch some YouTube videos on, you know, uh, doing this for automobiles, which is that's where you're going to find the video showing you how to do this because we are using auto paint. And even if you're not using auto paint, you know, anytime you're doing using compounds and buffing, you know, that's where you want to go look. Look at the auto, you know, detailing videos. But, uh, up there, right there, you can see about how much pressure I'm putting. I'm, I'm putting a good bit of pressure right here. You know, that pad's not really spinning. It's just kind of vibrating. It's spinning a little bit, but you know, you don't want to, uh, you, you got to put some pressure on it. You can't just let it have its own weight on there and expect it to do anything. Remember, we're trying to cut into the paint and remove those, those uh, scratches. Here we're trying to get rid of the scratches that we left from our wet sanding. So some of those scratches may be a little bit deep and you may still see them. So you just keep working this compound until those scratches are gone. Keep it clean and look at it between passes because you will have some little fine scratches that may be hidden. You know with the, the oils in the compound will kind of hide some of the scratches. So get it clean and kind of look at it. And it's really looking like it's looking good. We're getting that glass. And I know this can be a little intimidating at first to try, you know, this type of process, but I'm telling you. It's not that hard. You got two hands, just like everybody else. Well, not everybody, but heck, even if you only have one hand, you could probably still pull this off. It's not that difficult. I mean, it's just knowing the steps. And you see here in the clear coat, I mean, it, our uh, clear coat job wasn't really that good. When I sprayed the clear coat on, I had a crap load of orange peel. You know, I mean, I've seen worse, but I've definitely seen better. And uh, look at it. I mean, look at that glass. 
we can you know we can bring it back so it's really hard to mess up and the reward i mean this is not uh you know if you're putting this in your living room this is pretty dang awesome i mean you're going to get comments on how i mean, look at that speaker i mean it, you know it looks professionally done it looks like you spent a ton of money on it and really we didn't i mean you can get in my clear coat i think i spent 70 bucks for a gallon of it and that gallon i could probably do you know 10 15 you know larger subwoofers than this i mean uh, there's no telling i could probably do two cars with that gallon of uh, clear coat i mean it, it's a lot of clear coat and you know the base coat we didn't use much base coat at all the primer was that was those were quart cans and i could probably do three or four subwoofers with that primer so it goes a long way it's not really that expensive we're using a 30 dollar hvlp sprayer you know the price is going to add up of course like anything when you start buying all the little knickknacks you need for it but you can use them long term you can continue to use them on other projects and i'm mean, you know it's uh the reward is the finish that you get is worth it now you have to be very careful on this baffle right here i actually burnt through it you know i should have been doing this by hand when i was getting that that inside edge i don't think i burnt through it on this step but uh at some point i did burn through a little bit of it on the very edge and i had to touch it up you know but like i said you can fix this stuff it's not a big deal if you have a little burn through on an edge it can be fixed or it can be hidden where no one's gonna know it but you now that was a little harbor freight look got a little round deal that goes on your drill to kind of help buff it doesn't do real good but i mean it kind of helps so i went and used it now inside here that little port brace you see me trying to get it buffed out, trying to get a shine back to it. I shouldn't really have hit that with uh, when I sand it. I should have just left it alone because it already had a gloss from just a clear coat. But I put a little sand on it, you know, trying to wet sand it, and I should have left it alone. So anyway, now it's time to start buffing. So that's what we're using. We've got our buffing pad, and this some is some really good uh, buffing cream or whatever the heck you want to call it. It's really, really, really good. Now. It's kind of hard to catch on camera because we've already got a really good shine but i mean it really just makes it deeper it makes the color look deeper almost like you could jump into this dang subwoofer like it's water i mean it's it's hard to put into words how much it you know that final touch really brings it out it doesn't take long because our compound was done so well i mean man look at that that is a really nice i mean look at that depth but the compound did so well you know this step right here we're just just icing the cake real quick just making a single pass on it it's not taking as long at all and my video camera actually stopped so i didn't get the entire process but i mean it's you pretty much get the picture you know you're just gonna put a few drops you're gonna go and make your cross hatch patterns and buff the sucker out wipe it off and you're done all right so now we're putting our stuffing back in our insulation now of course this is optional the only reason i did it because i was running test sweeps you know i had the sub going up uh 250 hertz for a crossover i heard a little you could hear it a little bit resonating in there just at the very top of that you know when you're running to 80 hertz you know for a crossover it's not an issue i just like to do it because i don't know something in me makes me want to line and uh in win isd when you model it it makes no difference uh the, the response changing with the insulation was basically nothing all right so we're putting our feet on here and those that pack of eight rubber feet's like five bucks i've bought them more than once and used them on a couple projects they work great they're cheap no sense in spending anything else in my opinion we're going to be using the same one inch screws that we used to put the driver and the plate amp on they work really well and we've got them on hand now this is the isolation platform now this is not done here there was a there were a few modifications i made while I, along the way you're going to see some pics at the end in a video of it of how well the isolation platform works this will be part of the flat pack kit that you can get that's going to be available uh and cut by gsg now gsg reached out and said that episode 7 which is the subwoofer setup episode where you take the mini dsp and roomy q wizard and get the sub set up and aligned perfectly that episode has helped their customers so much that they graciously offered to cut these kits for us so if you're interested 
and ordering some of these kits, these hammer kits, look in the description below and you're going to find information on how to do that. This is not going to be a GSG product, so you're not going to see it on their website, but like I said, they have agreed to cut the kits for us. So if you're interested in that, look in the description and it'll tell you how to get these flat packs. And here we go right here, the isolation platform. You see I'm kind of shaking the subwoofer back and forth. You are not going to transfer anything at all to the room. And look at that shine. And this sucker looks good. And of course I'd paint those tennis balls black. But those tennis balls are not tennis balls, they are pressurized isolators. That's right. Alright, here's the driver in action. And we're getting a lot of movement. I mean, it's distorting the audio of my cell phone every time the bass would hit. You, you're, you can't hear anything, but it's getting after it. I mean, the little sucker pounds. Alright guys, so that's going to be it. I'll just leave you with a few pictures. Some glamour shots, but uh, that's it. If you're interested in the flat pack, just look in the description and it's going to show you how to order it. And yeah, I guess I'll see y'all for the next one and I'll try to get a flat pack on hand or in my shop here and we'll build it. So uh, anyway, you guys have a good one. I'll see y'all next time.